Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element, with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to be talking about consumer food waste initiatives with Associate Professor Simon Lockery. So he is a leading sustainability and design-based entrepreneur, innovation warrior for a better world, and the key leader of the food fight, uh, the Fight Food Waste Project. Hi, thanks for joining me today. Hi, Gabriella. It's great to be here. Yeah. So before we get started with that topic today, do you mind, um, you know, introducing yourself so we get to know you a bit better? Yeah, sure. So um, I started uh, my professional life as a design engineer, trained as a design engineer and went off into the world and designed all sorts of things from, you know, the top of your cellies, super glue that doesn't stick with the steel pin all the way through to aerospace equipment. Uh, interior furniture and interior design with Scavillo and then across in the UK designing vacuum cleaners for Dyson. So all sorts of cyclonic um, wonderments in the UK. Uh, I got to a point uh, sort of 10 years into my career where I started questioning why things were made the way they were and why we were putting all this stuff into the world uh, and I started to ask some questions at work <laughs> and uh, it, it ended up that I was uh, offered a job back in Australia as a research fellow at RMIT University to uh, start sustainability research that was very practically driven. So uh, sustainability research with industry and government to try and solve some of the sustainability issues that we, we face around climate change, waste and the like. Uh, that work led to me to do a whole lot of really cool projects with uh, companies like CHEP and uh, Busy. Nestle, government departments like Sustainability Victoria, to queue up in the federal government. Uh, it even took me all the way to Antarctica to do research around uh, the way that we run our bases down there. So it's been a pretty wild and uh, wonderful ride. Uh, I did a PhD in the process and now sit in the School of Design at RMIT. Still do a lot of sustainability research and really just manage research. I really don't do a lot of teaching. It's mainly big um, large fund funded type projects uh, and as you mentioned in your introduction I'm now part of the Fight Food Waste Cooperative Research Centre, the Fight Food Waste CRC uh, which is a $121 million federally uh, funded, industry funded, not for profit uh, connected and consumer connected which is important for today uh, project looking to halve food waste by 2030 so I run a one of the three programs in that CRC the reduce program obviously our aim is to reduce food waste by 2030 by half so we've got a pretty crucial role in that in that goal yeah we're not too many years away from 2030 no. now that i think about it <laughs> we're not we're not and uh, we've got a lot to do uh, we, we certainly track the way that we're uh we're going through our projects with a really interesting uh impact tracker which looks at the food waste we've reduced or transformed uh, the jobs we've created, the profitability that we've driven for industry and the greenhouse gas emissions we reduced too. So yeah, it's it's a very ambitious target, but I'm a very half glass full kind of person, although this glass probably needs a bit more water. I'll make that half full set. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll hopefully smash that goal. And, and then after that, there's another half to reduce. So we need to get to nil, right? No food waste. Mm. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this topic. I think it's very important and also very interesting. So we're going to do a section we call Have You Met Simon? That's where we get to know you with a few of your favorite things. And our first question is, what is your favorite food? Oh, this is a loaded question for someone who works in a fight food waste CRC. Uh, my favorite food, frankly, is all food. I eat everything. <laughs> uh, 
I've had to eat less recently because uh, I've been trying to um, you know keep myself trim, getting into my forties. It's something you have to start looking at. But hey, I, I like anything from you know lovely uh, Thai curries through to you know a great um, you know pork tenderloin on the on the web or with a beautiful barbecue rub. Through to you know comfort food, uh, you know a um, a nice pub meal that's done at the Lincoln Hotel in Melbourne, the best pub in in Australia, a few years in a row. You know those kind of meals I love. Um, I suppose when you get into this field that I'm in now, uh, you start to look at food very differently, and uh, I also love food that hasn't been wasted. So mm-hmm. that's another dimension to what I look at when I'm. Thinking about food, I like. Um, are you listening to any music at the moment? I'm definitely listening to some great music at the moment. I used to be a bit of a uh, festival head. I used to go to Glastonbury and Exit Festival and all those European festivals when I was doing it. But what we've been listening to at High End recently is I've been getting a lot of the vinyl of the CDs I had in the 90s. And there was a series called the Back to Mind series, which catalogued different DJs from around the world, house DJs and trance DJs, but it it basically uh, collected compilations of music they listen to when they go back to their house after they've done a DJ set in the morning. So these really wonderful compilations that mix anything from an underworld trance mix through to Barry White singing a love song through to some really interesting, weird, you know, theme song from a, 70s tv show so yeah it's it's a great series i recommend it to anyone put on some vinyl the back to mind series faithless danny tenaglia these kind of djs or groups from the 90s doing their favorite lounge and relaxation music that sounds so interesting i've never heard of that before just or even the idea of um yeah what people listen to afterwards yeah that's Um, it (laughs) Because I imagine you wouldn't want to be listening to the same thing again. No, and it's weird how some of them will insert a harder track that would probably be from the club they've just performed at, but then reduce it down to something that's like Barry White or Tears for Fears, you know, something a lot more relaxed. Um, Because, yeah, you're right, you get home, do you really want to be partying? (laughs) Uh, You probably want to be relaxing. Yeah, exactly. Um, And do you have a role model? Yeah, I do actually. Um, my my key role model is my father. So my father was a management consultant turned banker, uh, but he very much prioritised his family. Um, he didn't work the ridiculous hours. It's one of the reasons he got into banking. Actually, it was it gave him a chance to still do very well in business, but not be as. Um, you know, tied to the job as, say, a partner of a management consulting firm. But also his ethical and moral compass and mindset. He's quite religious, um, which isn't something I'm maybe, you know, as consistent on that with the sim, but a lot of the values have rubbed off on me and probably have influenced why I've got into sustainability. Um, that's something that I think you can link very directly back to my father's you know, approach to being kind of people you know, being empathetic, uh, wanting good things to happen and, and working towards good outcomes generally uh, and having just a good you know, a good mindset about things. Mm. Yeah, I think that it's so nice to have someone who's close to you who you can really model yourself after, even if you don't necessarily take everything that they have, sure. you know, like, you know, their um, religion, but you can still take their morals and, the, the really good parts of them. That's right. Yeah. And look, I, I have enjoyed in the last few years, certainly since COVID as well, finishing, I'm um, really getting quite yeah, close again to my father. Um, I think we all reflected over COVID a whole lot of stuff, but and one of the things I reflected on was you know, making sure that you're uh, servicing your close relationships properly because we do, we do tend to sort of get lost in the modern world the fast-paced nature of it, the time corners of it. So, yeah, I've, I've certainly been trying to reach out. I took my dad fishing for his birthday on a chartered ship this year, caught a few uh, mackerel, and, yeah, I want to do more of that. Mm. One thing I did enjoy about lockdown, not that I enjoyed lockdown, but um, I did end up calling my parents a lot just to be like, oh, hey, yeah. what are you doing? Um, 
And now I call them and they're like, oh, I'm actually out now. <laughs> Can you call later? <laughs> yeah, well, people have gone back to some, you know, some normality, I suppose. But look, I think those habits that have happened, the good habits through COVID have hopefully stuck, you know, somewhat still. They're probably not exactly the same, but there are some good outcomes from COVID that are, you know, mm. hopefully we're going to retain and keep going. Like working from home, uh, although there are also rebound effect issues of that as well in terms of the blurring of work life and social life, home life. Uh, but yeah, look, there's there's plenty to be said for uh, servicing your close relationships properly. Definitely. And have you done a course that has inspired you? Yeah, recently I did a course actually was quite connected to, um, to that, which is, uh, it was a short course, so it was only half a day on mindfulness. And I remember um, watching a show on um, Amazon by a guy called Hugh Van Kylenberg, who runs the Resilience Project. It's a show called Gem. I actually went to school with you. I played cricket with you as well um, in the, the Carey First Eleven. Uh, but look, he's gone on to a really interesting career in resilience. And his definition of mindfulness is basically um, absorbing the here and now. So, so making sure you, you're, you know, at one with your surroundings and the things going on around you, because that's really, yeah, you know, what we have, right? It's all we really have. There's past and, and future, but we're actually here now. And a lot of the stuff we do around us, you know, things like devices, the work mindset we might have, um, all these things distract us from actually enjoying our here and now. And mindfulness helps you tap back into that. You know, walking around the block twice and listening to the birds and listening to the trees and looking at what's going on around you, the insects, the grass. So we did a course on mindfulness techniques uh, the tail end of last year in the Fight Food Waste CRC with our entire delivery group. And there was one exercise we did where we closed our eyes and uh, tried to tap into the sounds around us. And I actually fell, almost fell asleep. I got so into it. And I think this, this idea of meditation and connecting into things um, more deeply, it really resonated with me. And I think probably off the back of COVID, I think a lot of people would be would do well to investigate mindfulness on a, on a deeper level. So I recommend anyone, if they get a chance to do any mindfulness training or courses or even just watch Hugh's show, Gem, on Amazon. Now, if you've got Amazon, it's free on Amazon. So um, check it out. Yeah, I'll have to have a look. I've done a little bit of mindfulness, but I wasn't completely sold. I think I need a bit more work before I figure that one it's interesting. out. interesting. He, he said that about one of the people. So he, he has three um, uh, Gem is an acronym for uh, for gratitude, empathy, and mindfulness. And so he said one of the key people in the empathy space <laughs> told him that they had not sold on mindfulness, but that's obviously because they love, have gone deeply into empathy. Um, but look, I'm, I think everyone um, has a chance with mindfulness if they if they do actually investigate it in depth. And, and I'm certainly I've started actually applying some of the tools that I've been exposed to and they help just, you know, with calming yourself down, um, de-stressing. If anything, it's just good for that, you know, reducing anxiety and those kind of things that maybe when we're always on um, seems to build up insidiously without you even knowing. Unconsciously, it starts to get to you and affect the way that you act so, and feel. Mm, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, how do you define household management? Oh, it's, what are what I our term to define? Uh, I mean, I I would treat household management as just you know, managing the day to day of everything you're going to do in your home life. Uh, whether that be, yeah, you know, if you've got kids, managing their movements, um, managing your food intake, storage, preparation, purchase, disposal, managing how you're utilizing the energy in your house. You know, what has to be on and what doesn't have to be on. Link to that. Managing your, your core temperature, <laughs> which is actually connected to the systems in your house or not in your house. Um, 
and on a social and you know connected space, managing your relationships and your your interactions with other people that you live with or around where you live, even like your neighbours, your neighbourhood, um, the people that come in and out of your life. You know, we've, we're on pretty good terms with our postman, that he's a man, and some of our couriers are all men and women who rock up to our house quite like interacting with them. So with COVID, we started seeing them a lot more. Uh, so yeah, look, household management is, is this whole nexus of things that you've got to deal with. You know, it's a bit like... Yeah, you know, in business, business management is running all of the operations of the business. Well, so is the house, but you know, it's it's not a business per se. Mm. You still have to manage it, even if it's not a house. It, it is a house. Um, yeah. And what about some misconceptions about household management? Uh, well, look, I think um, a lot of people <laughs> that I interact with uh, are either all in, you know, total management, absolutely, you know, almost OCD on managing the household and managing every aspect of it, all the way through in, in a spectrum of just, you know, easy as she goes, really not much management and there's a lot of chaos going on. Um, I, on top of that, a layer on top of that is this idea that maybe household management is boring or just, you know, stuff that you, something just can't sink their teeth into but what I've observed is everyone has sort of aspects of household management they enjoy in some way so as an example uh, I love cooking food and managing the process of cooking mainly because it's a creative outlet and I'm from a design background it distresses me um, but I know some people quite very close to me that actually get stressed out by cooking and don't enjoy it um, well, that's great. They might like something else in household management. And so it's good if they can do that. Now, so I, I, I don't buy into this perspective that you know, there are some people who just, um, you know, don't have a place in the household management spectrum, but um, maybe I haven't met some of those people that do absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, everyone's talents are so diverse, but then also what you need in a house is also really diverse. So yeah. it's just about trying different things and seeing what works for you. Yeah. And um, if you live with other people, I guess, figuring out yeah. what everyone's good at. Yeah, I mean, I've lived on my own before and that's a very different proposition to living, you know, in a, you know, a partnership or with a family or with housemates in a share house. So there are always different dimensions, Gabriella, um, to those contexts, even if they're the same, like a share house versus a share house, they're going to be very different based on the people, the house itself, the things in it, the things that interact with house so yeah i mean we always say in the fight food waste crc that the household level of food waste as a context is the fuzziest because it's the most diverse in terms of the things that can go on supply chains we can you know have a relatively good understanding of what's going on because we sort of manage it in that business management mode whereas when you get into the house how do you manage someone getting up and drinking milk at 1am or how do you manage you know (laughs) someone just picking out on two packets of chips or someone buying bulk buying five chickens because they're on special and then what do you do with that so you Mm. you know that's not as manageable or predictable as say the throughput of the supply chain of chickens or the supply chain of something else and i think even um i mean from my personal experience um that you know, I'm trying to to figure out um, what we're going to use in our household. And then part of the issue is we think, oh, okay, well, we have to make this food, this food, this food. And then you end up, you know, oh, I'm too tired to make this today. I'll buy something else or I'll go to get a takeaway. And at the end of the week, you know, I've overestimated how much food we needed. Um, That's right. So it's not just, I guess, researchers. It's, it's, it's us. It's the consumers. That's right. Everyone is a consumer. Everyone lives in a household most on the most part. And so everyone has experience with this idea of um, if we if we sort of have the subset of household management to food food management or food practices in our we all have some kind of experience with it. And you know our Western sort of developed world mode of operating is a very time poor, busy, you know, um, overfilled social context. Yeah, you know, we we're meeting up with people where 
go you've got to take away on a whim we we end up staying at work and eating in the city rather than eating at home all these things affect your ability to properly plan and deploy food in a systematic and predictable way but there are a lot of um, ways in which we can mitigate waste occurring even with those interruptions or changes to plans or you know interruptions in time through social or business interruption um, or change so we can talk we're obviously we'll talk about a little bit of that kind of thing later yeah definitely um, so you're running um, the the fight food waste yeah. um, so what is a food waste initiative so a fight a uh, Food waste initiative, from our perspective, um, we categorise into three areas, which are our three programs. So either f- food waste reduction, so reducing it before it becomes waste. Food waste transformation, which is when we've got some waste we haven't been able to reduce, but we turn it into something of high value that we're able to distribute or sell um, afterwards. Or fighting food waste through engagement. Uh, and engagement can be anything from us training new PhD or master's students to be leaders in the future, um, engaging consumers on their level with good education campaigns, so behaviour change campaigns, providing them tools and support and behavioural infrastructure in the home so, so they can um, better manage food practices in the home, all the way through to engagement across the supply chain, back through the supply chain, all the way to the farm through retail, processing, supply chain, cold chain, so that we can either train people, provide them the tools in their jobs in the supply chain to reduce food waste along that chain too. Um, So any initiative that we run fits within those three programs and either fits along the value chain from the farm to fork or at the fork in someone's home or out, say in a food service context like a restaurant or a cafe or a... um, or uh, you know some kind of institutional food service context. The other thing I just mentioned is also food rescue, being um, when we distribute food for free to people who can't afford food, who are in food poverty, and that's quite a you know, a big social issue beyond the environmental issue of food waste, where we have anywhere up to a million people in Australia are in food poverty at any time, uh, and that is only getting worse with cost of living issues, interest rate rises, inflation supply chain shocks to the cost of things. Um, So that's another dimension of where we play and we run initiatives um, for food waste reduction through making sure that if there is some wasted food, if there's the opportunity to give it away, that we we enable that in the most um, easy way possible. Hmm. And you're in the reduction and the waste area, is that correct? Yeah, so my program is the reduction, the reduce program. So we look mm-hmm. at reducing food waste before it happens. Uh, so we try to intervene on the farm or in the factory or in the supply chain, the logistics chain of trucks and ships and cold chain through the retail stores and then in the home and food service institutions to try and see whether there are ways that before it actually gets to a point where it is waste. Um, mm. We reduce it through tools, through initiatives around practices and behaviours through, um, you know, other interventions, technologies uh, and the like. And the other thing I just mentioned is um, the, the word waste. So it's a problematic word, even though it's in the title of our institution. <laughs> I mean, every every bit of waste is a resource. So if you ever hear Nicola from Planet R talk about waste, she'll always start her presentations um, with this, this idea that Waste isn't actually waste. Every bit of waste is actually a valuable resource. We could be turning into something else um, of value that someone is either willing to pay for or you can give it to people for free who still value it because they can't afford to buy food, buy something like like that. Interesting. I never thought about it like that. Um, But I guess it does make sense, the whole, the, um, you know, turning uh, one man's trash is another man's yeah, treasure. It's another way to basically another way to frame it is that that um, colloquial term, yeah. And it's mm. absolutely um, you sort of when you're in these jobs, you sort of get almost weird about it. I suppose we'll talk a little bit about that later. I think we talk about mm-hmm. a few of my other things I do. So. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess why should we be do- why should we reduce our waste? It's number one, number one question. Yeah, it's a good, very good question. 
um, there's some very, very uh, compelling and big reasons um, and they're big numbers as to why we should be reducing our waste. Um, if food waste globally were a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. Wow. It is a huge environmental issue. It is after the US and China, the third biggest nation in climate change. Now that's bigger than a lot of industries. It's certainly bigger than most countries. It's bigger than every country bar too, in terms of how much. And that's just the food waste. If you look at the food system, that's actually more than double that because wow. you know, you've got all of the embedded carbon and the, the, um, the food system. So it's a big area just to begin with. Um, I've mentioned the issue around food security. So we don't actually, at this point in time in history, we don't actually not produce enough to feed everyone. We do produce enough to feed everyone, but we don't distribute it to everyone. So we have in Australia a ridiculous amount of people hungry who can't afford it that we should be trying to get that food to. Now, if we talk about other countries where they're no more, you know, they're, they're even in even more more trouble, um, hunger-wise, oh, we should be trying to get food to those people too, but we just don't mm. do it. So there is a massive social reason why we should reduce food waste um, because we shouldn't be wasting stuff that should be going to people that need it. Exactly. And the third reason is, is financial. It is a multi-trillion dollar waste of resources that we put into producing food. And if you just look at um, Australian households, if we're wasting anyway from thirty to forty percent of our, you know, our our food, well, you could basically go to the, you know, shopping centre, buy four bags of shit of food and throw one in the bin straight away. So, pull your money out, pay for it, then throw it straight in the trash can. And that's a good, I think, illustration of why we should stop because you're just wasting money. Not to mention all the money that's been spent along the supply chain. That you're not respecting, you know, respecting farmers and food producers who put in all of that work to get that food to you. So it's it's a compelling triple bottom line reason why we should be reducing food waste. Definitely. Um, so just on your second point, which was the you know producing food that we're not giving to other people. Yeah. Um, Something that I was told as a kid, I think everyone was told this, was, you know, finish everything on your plate. You know, there are starving kids in whichever country. But realistically, we couldn't actually give the food that we have in our homes now to, I mean, unless there was someone down the road from you who was hungry and needed food. That's right. It's, yeah. it's unrealistic to actually have the food in your home and give it to someone else. So how can, like, me as a consumer, how does my food waste... Um, affect other people really yeah so i mean the food rescue issue is a lot harder to um make tangible in the home right there's no doubt about that um food rescue is probably more uh more achievable uh, along the supply chain before it gets to someone's home so you know our most of our initiatives around food rescue are aimed at big corporates like the coles and woolies of this world Mars, Nestle, those big brands, where they are incentivized to make sure that things don't go to waste, and if they do, that they're able to then reorient it to the likes of Food Bank, Second Bite, Fair Share, and the other Oz Harvest, all, all the not-for-profits that help people like that. Uh, one area where that probably is a bit different is when you go out to a restaurant or a cafe um, or quick service restaurant. We are working hard there to see whether we can reposition food that hasn't been consumed by you or I, whether that can be easily distributed to people who are hungry. So as an example, um, we're looking at apps where people who are food um, insecure uh, have an app and are able to actually tap into that and then go to a restaurant and get that food in a respectful way to all parties. Because again, there's a, quite a stigma around it, right? both for the businesses and for the people who are food insecure. And you'd be surprised the kind of people who are now food insecure, Gabrielle, like with, with the cost of living issue, like we've, we've heard stories in the last few months from Brianna, the head of Food Bank, Ronnie's the head of Oz Harvest, Ronnie Khan, 
of people who are who have traditionally been quite well off and have quite you know reasonable assets in terms of a house. I'm not talking people who, who are homeless, who, and that is a big issue. People who are homeless not being you know able to afford food. People who have actually you know participated in the economy who can't afford food now because they can't afford to pay their mortgage or they've lost their job because of you know all of the issues with the current uh, downturn in the economy uh, and they don't have um, the wherewithal to ask for free food because they the stigma there is stigma involved in doing so anything we can do to make it easier uh, is something we're interested in in funding and like I said we've got a lot of um, good resources 121 million at 60 million in cash and 60 million of in-kind for people like researchers like me or uh, industry people committing their time to solve these problems. Uh, another really, really key one for food rescue is tax incentives. We have now worked with KPMG uh, and KPMG have done a model which shows that for a very small budget, bottom line um, item, you know, we're talking a few million dollars, you could put tax incentives on the afterburner where all actors in the supply chain from trucking companies to retailers, food companies would actually get it, not just a tax deduction, but a tax incentive to donate food to Oz Harvest and um, Second Bite and everyone like that. And it would it would really drive um, a massive change. Uh, we're talking, you know, 10, 20, 30 times you know, um, increase in viability of, of that sector. So, yeah, look, there are a lot of things we're playing in. It's not just around practical things. It's also policy and, you know, regulations and all sorts of issues that we're dealing with in this um, this game of trying to reduce food waste to nil. <laughs> yeah, there certainly is a lot of, I guess, yeah, different different aspects that ne- we, that you need to, I guess, manoeuvre to try and reduce this problem. Yeah. Um, but... Um, I am going to sort of focus on the consumer side because, um, you know, our listeners, um, you know, if you, if you do own a really big company and you can do something about this, do it. But for most people, we can't. That's right. Yeah. So, um, and I guess one thing we could do is if we buy just the food that we're actually going to eat, then the rest of the food in the supermarket can go towards these programs. Correct. And then also supermarkets just order, you know, they, they learn from how people buy and consume. So they will then adjust the way that they're actually, you know, producing or ordering, and so will the supply chain back from. So, um, but there are also lots of things in the home that we can do, even if we do over order or over buy, to make sure that that food still doesn't go to waste. And it all revolves around food practices in the home, around storage, preparation, uh, and and practices that maybe. You know, through, through maybe a reduction in food literacy that has occurred over a period of decades, um, not not as many people are aware of the kinds of things that maybe the, you know, the Greek and Italian communities or the Vietnamese and Malaysian communities who came to this country as migrants just deploy as part of their culture and their practices. Um, it's probably, they're probably things that we need to start bringing back, preserving, mm-hmm. cooling, you know, freezing, defrosting type techniques that will mean that even if you do um, over-order, over-buy, mm. that you still have a chance of using that food in some way. Do you mind sharing, you know, maybe a few easy ones that, um, you know, um, listeners can try out? Absolutely. So uh, I'll give you one example that's very food-based, uh, food-specific based. Um, I remember back when I was a kid um, and my, my background is actually Anglo-Saxon. A lot of people think that I'm Italian and they're like, I'm big or when they see me, it's like, oh, I'm not Italian, but you can talk Italian too, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> very Anglo-Saxon background. So it would be meat and three veg, right? And and the vegetables would be steamed uh, and all of the skin would be cut off the pumpkin and the seeds would get taken out and chopped into little squares and then steamed and then provided to you. Plate. Well, those seeds... Uh, bloody delicious when you bake them uh, and that skin when you put some olive oil and salt on them is just delicious caramelizes up you know crisps up and so baking or using steaming and baking whatever you're going to do a whole pumpkin and all the bits of the pumpkin 
is actually a really good idea. Uh, the the seeds are highly nutritious with all sorts of really good eat, you know n- nutrients in them as well uh, to deal with issues around things like diabetes and um, iron and, and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, just even learning about how you can utilize the whole of a vegetable, the whole of the meat um, that you're cooking is a is a good good moment. And then saves you money because you are using all of what you buy. That said, another area that I think is really, really key is learning about um, how do you appropriately store product that's been bought and also store food that are leftovers with the knowledge and insights about how you might utilize leftovers in new meals or meals later on that are just sort of reheated or um, or even eaten cold. And so this issue of um, storage and preparation knowledge and expertise is something I think we've clearly lost a lot of um, food literacy in that space. And something that we're looking at um, very soon is, is a, a big project that's been funded by four of the state governments, um, Sustainability Victoria, New South Wales EPA, uh, QDARES up in Queensland and um, Green Industry South Australia looking at date labelling and storage advice on products that come into our home so that we are providing the behavioural infrastructure, i.e. guidance. Um, it might not just be on packages, it might actually be off on QR codes, and data systems to provide people with really quick and easy resources about what do I do with this? Do I just store it in the cupboard? Do I store it in the freezer? Can I defrost something? Um, how long do, can I can I freeze it for and then defrost it? How long do I need? Can I refreeze it? Does it can I only freeze it once, or can I actually freeze it almost you know, forever? Like what? What's what's the deal there? These are things that are very um, accessible now on Google. Like you can look these kind of things up, but that's just another barrier, right? Having to go and seek out that information. If we can give as much of that information to people on a platter. Pardon the pun. <laughs> you know, the, the the better we chance we have of people being able to do that. Uh, where we, interestingly, um, there's a lot of, you know, I suppose bad press about plastic. Uh, plastic's not the problem. Single use plastic is the problem, and single use is the problem. Right? It's the way that we've devalued plastic. Plastic is a beautiful engineering material. I collect 1970s plastic from Italy, um, you know, the likes of Joe Colombo and Achille Castiglione that are now highly valuable items in MoMA and the Triennale in Milano because we've we worked out ways to make plastic beautiful and functional and, and, and great, but by devaluing plastic in the food system in particular with single-use plastic, um, I think it's got a really bad rap with consumers, with us. And it's fair enough because it goes out into oceans, in, you know, in litter, out in, in the biosphere and it's, it's shocking. Now, if you take your takeaway containers from your local Chinese shop or your local Vietnamese place and you look at the shape of it, they're rectangular generally. There are no those round ones as well, but the rectangular ones. Have a look at the shape of your fridge and freezer. It's rectangular and square. Now, have a look at how nicely and neatly they nest into your freezer and utilizing those as a really great reuse item rather than throwing them straight out in the recycling. These little PET containers, they last for ages. If you can use them as a system to actually store your food in your freezer and your fridge, that actually increases the shelf life of the food, whether it's in cold or frozen conditions. And also it helps you manage that food in a way if you want to label it or just know where things are, are located. If you talk to a lot of chefs, I can think of some in particular, like um, Matt Wilkinson, who runs um, Montalto down on the Mornington Peninsula. That's how they arrange their food in a really sort of systematic way in, in restaurants. Uh, these are the kinds of practices you can start to apply at home to help you organise and also increase the shelf life of your food uh, and hopefully then really start reducing that food waste down to nil based on you know that approach. But you're utilising something that gets a pretty bad rap, which is single-use plastic in the process of doing it 
But don't be afraid of that. That's a good outcome because you've then you've used that plastic more and more times. And if you look at that from a life cycle assessment perspective, you're probably better off doing that um, than buying something that's a bit more you know robust uh, and not using it much. If you use those takeaway containers, they're, they're a great system to to actually start organising yourself in the home. Particularly since um, I don't know any about anyone else, I'm try not to use those things, but they do appear. Yeah, you know, I do. People give them to you, yeah. um, or you know, you you get t- um, some food and you don't eat enough and you don't want to waste the food, so you get a plastic box. And um, I think they're great in the freezer because I can actually write on yeah. them yeah. Um, what it is when I put it in there. I can even put a you know eat by if I want to, yeah. um, rather than you know, putting something in the freezer and six months later, oh, what is this? They are, they are oh. a great tool. And look, even just little hacks like that are just so gold, golden for reducing your food waste in the home. It's like for practical tips like that. But we need to go further than that, obviously, and provide people like mm. the information about that food that you've written on the top. Like how long can you leave it in there? You need that almost, you know, at the same time as doing that practice of storing and freezing. So- the project we're looking at is how do we actually provide that information as well as give tips about, hey, use your takeaway containers, don't throw them out, uh, the reason, the packaging. The other the other thing I'd say is packaging in the food system at the moment, the way where our food system is designed is actually necessary. Um, there's all this talk about get rid of packaging in the, in the food system. Uh, well, I agree. Like Having no packaging would be great, but it's not going to happen. And the reason is because we've got centralised farms across Australia delivering you food that you want unseasonably as well, so not in season. Uh, so you, we need in Melbourne, for instance, to get food down from Queensland across from South Australia or from Tasmania at different times a year to deal with that demand. Now, if we want to move to a non-packaging system, we would have to have farms in Kew, Sandringham, where I am, um, Footscray, Sunbury, yeah, you know, Brunswick, micro farms everywhere. We'd have to eat seasonally and we'd have to go to the supermarket probably two or three times a week, maybe even more, to go and purchase that food on a just in time basis. So packaging has a role. And at the moment, the role is being fit for purpose in elongating shelf life, getting food to your fit, um, stay to consume, and keeping it that way for a long period of time. Now, it can do more. And we should get rid of packaging if we can. If there is a ro- not a role for packaging, if we can utilize the fridge or other things in our home uh, and we can get food in a good condition to our house with our packaging, then we should get rid of that packaging. There's no question from a sustainability perspective. But, um, and this is quite controversial stuff I'm saying because the, you know, I'm a sustainability professor. <laughs> and, but I'm happy to say it because it is, it is what it is and, uh, and people have you know, obviously challenged um challenge the system i think we do need to challenge a system we can't have the kind of plastic proliferation we've got at the moment but paper also has an impact on the environment aluminium does as well so do bioplastics they all do so the issue is not plastic per se it is actually single use consumerism that drive drives the system and the way we set the system up and they're, they're mm. the real problems So, yeah, you've mentioned that you're working on some ways, you know, like including some more information, um, you know, into, uh, you know, into the packaging and everything um, and, you know, using packaging in a way that is more sustainable, I guess, you know, not necessarily getting rid of packaging, but being more mindful, mindful about it. Um, But what um, what other ways can we can we as consumers um, yeah, um, reduce our food waste. Um, and um, how can you help us? So there are a number of projects afoot in the CRC that are aimed at helping consumers. The first projects really have been run to understand what the problems are. So we ran quite a large national survey, uh, which covered um, the spectrum of the Australian population and asked them questions about food waste, packaging, practices in the home and purchasing, storage, preparation to and we ran a large project with Woolworths and Sustainability Victoria on understanding packaging and food waste and how that issue, you know, basically happens in the home for different categories of food. 
So now it's really about action, right? Projects to help, as you said, projects sat, you know, intervened, it assist. Um, there are certainly some uh, app, apps that are being developed that are going to assist um, consumers. As one in particular, we're about to run a project pilot on, which helps um, in the retail context, uh, running discounts for people who have profiles on the platform to go and buy discounted food when it's close to use by. So that's helping the retailer reduce their waste but also provides us with discounts so we get cheaper food. Off the back of that, you'd have to use that food up to be quick because it's, you know, it's close to use by and, and the like. The project I mentioned before about use by dates and and um, store or best before dates, use by dates and, and storage advice, that project will hopefully result in a whole lot of changes to the way use by dates and best before dates are communicated or are even there or not if they're not necessary. So retiring some of those. So the confusion that flows from those dates is is um, clarified or just it's gotten rid of by getting rid of dates that aren't needed. Because those dates can really drive, um, you know, can, can drive people to waste food without, um, without really needing to. Storage advice might be on pack. It might be off pack. It actually might be data systems. Like I said, it might be apps, QR codes to web, you know, web databases. It might be other types of device-based apps that help you, you know, with um, you know, prompting you about the inventory you have in your um, your fridge or your or your cupboard. So that you're actually we provide tools through that process so that um, we have really active and um, real-time advice of people. That might even, you know, there are some apps out there that actually are looking at pulling the inventory you have in your fridge or your freezer or your cupboard and helping you create recipes off the back of what you have so that it makes it really easy for you to utilize all that food or tells you what you need to get along with what you have. So if you're on the way home, you go and pick up one thing and then you can cook something when you get home with all the other things you have at home, which is often a thing, right? Where you forget what you've got and you, then you buy all this other stuff and then you come home and go, oh crap, I've got all this other stuff still. So, um, I mean, I'm sure, well, the thing I'm sure you've experienced that, Gabriella. I was going to say the thing that happens with me is I'm like, oh, I'm going to make um, this food with this in these ingredients. And then I get home and I realize either the ingredient has been eaten by my partner yeah. or um, so, it has gone off in, since I've bought yeah. it. And then it's like, well, what do I do now? I can't use it. I have to go to the shops again. Yeah. yeah. And it can just be very frustrating. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you're saying that you know, these apps are going to take inventory of your fridge. Is that something like a smart fridge? It may not be. I might even use just imaging technology. There might be ways of um, plugging into, for instance, reward schemes. We've got all the retailers on board with the CRC. So if you have profile with, say, Woolworths, maybe it, these apps actually plug into that so that it will it will actually just place it all into your inventory based on what you buy. Um, so you utilizing those uh, reward schemes for good rather than marketing purposes. <laughs> uh, so you know there, there are all way, all sorts of ways we we are going to be looking at this in the next sort of five years that we're we're looking at these innovation projects. Um, but look, there are a lot of really cool technologies now just around imaging where you could literally scan with a phone and it picks everything up through um, an AI and then goes, "Cool, that's your inventory." Oh wow! Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, so there's like there's a lot of really interesting scope for that. But look, this project that we're running at the moment, it's all open. Like it's almost like, you know, it's a it's an open slather on what we can explore. Um there will also be some projects around um intervention through education and consumer behavior change. So, you know, the, imagine slip slop slap from the eighties and nineties around um skin cancer and sunscreen and which has I think evolved now to five S's not just three S's yeah it's like slip slop slap wrap and sunnies, sunnies and, and something I yeah. don't know something so else <laughs> think of that campaign but for food waste reduction so we're we're currently in some very constructive conversations with the federal government about how we fund that um, it's a core part of what our bid was based upon that we would want to run a consumer campaign that has longevity over time. So um, watch this space for that. And I, I would expect that has like a nationally recognized brand. It would have, you know, um, slogans that resonate with consumers around what little things you can do in the home around you know, 
freezing, thawing, <laughs> re, you know, recooking, remanufacturing, planning. A, a big thing is planning. So we mentioned before that, um, you know, you, you go and buy food and then you're distracted by doing something in the office or you, someone calls, calls you and you go and have a social, you know, get together with a friend, fine. But um, planning is still really key to actually reducing your food waste, even with those interruptions. There are maybe other things you can do around things like freezing and storage when you have those interruptions. But if you don't plan from the start, you, you're basically cactus anyway. You're not gonna you're not gonna have any chance of having a good outcome for food waste. You will waste stuff a lot more if you don't plan. And that's been shown in studies from Sweden, England, Europe, and Australia. So do you have any like suggestions on how people can plan, improve their planning? Yeah, well, there are apps for that. <laughs> I know I keep saying apps, but there are, there's an app for everything, right? But apps can be quite helpful for that kind of thing. I mean, it really, it's that it's practicing something a number of times to get it embedded as a behavior and then a habit. Uh, mm. So it might just be about like, you know, if you have a routine, where do you place the planning process? in a way that you know you're going to do it. Yeah, if it's, bo- if it's boring, you make it fun somehow. Like, how do you funify or gamify, ga- gamify the planning process? Um, turn it into a game. Don't don't get bored by it. Uh, you know, some people love shopping. Some people hate shopping. <laughs> so maybe you need to give the planning and shopping to the person who likes it rather than the person who doesn't because that's not going to end well, is it? Um no, definitely not. Or even the planning uh, is better with someone who likes organising as well, right? Mm-hmm. So you don't give it to – if you've got a household with more people, you don't get the person to plan who's the person who doesn't like organising. Or the person who doesn't like cooking. Yeah. They'll just say, just get takeaway. That's right. That's right. Or, I mean, the person who likes cooking might not be the planner either. They, it might be that you actually have a concert there, like a dance between the planner – and the the person who likes cooking. So I think, as we said right at the start of the conversation, households are diverse and people's needs, wants, desires, um, loves or dislikes are are diverse and different. So even just sitting down and having a brainstorm with your household about all of this is probably a good first step, is mapping out who should do what, who wants to do what, who doesn't want to do what, and then go from there. Yeah, thank that's you. a good way of pre-planning. So, what about what is something that you do in your own home that um, you use to manage your 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 own food and your food waste? So, I definitely apply that technique that I talked about before with the takeaway containers. I've almost taken mm. it to the most you know over, the OCD level, where our freezer is literally just columns of those containers, and they're different columns of like. You know, frozen vegetables that have been previously um, f- you know, roasted, fried or steamed, um, you know, leftover rice from takeaways, different types of rice, coconut rice, saffron rice, whatever, that you can mix into something. Um, bread goes in the freezer after three days. Do not leave it any longer because you could bring bread back to life and it's great in the toaster or in the microwave or in the, or in the oven. Um, but if you don't do that, you waste bread. And bread is one of the most wasted things when people don't actually manage it with the freezer. They just leave it, it goes moldy, they throw the whole half loaf out. So the fruit for me, the freezer is a really key thing for my practices in the home. And because I'm the one who loves to cook the most, I then utilize those items as ingredients or standalone parts of another meal. So I might, I might utilize the vegetables and recook them into something else or just have them stand alone as reheated to be the vegetables for another meal, as an example. Or meat might become something in something else or stand alone in, in another meal. Um, but another thing that I have implemented, you know, with waste when it, there's something I can't actually use. So we still have inedible food waste, right? So things like, you know, um, fat on meat or, you know, the little tops of um, particular vegetables that you aren't necessarily going to eat because you know, hard to crunch or whatever. Um, you know, the top of strawberries, well, you can eat them, frankly, mm. but if you want to cut those off, then you've still got that piece. 
um, we've implemented a worm farm. And so ah. the worm farm um, acts you know, as an ongoing waste management system and those worms will take you know, every two to three weeks we'll have a small thing of additional um, offcuts uh, that we put into the worm farm and say, say every month, month and a half, the two layers of the worm farm will flip around and we'll take the soil out of one and put them that soil into our planters that have vegetables and um, herbs grown. So that food waste is turned into soil by worms that then feeds a system of growing more food for our soil. Uh, Amazing. And you can even do that in small places. So worm farms can fit on balconies in small apartments or townhouses, as can a small planter. You know, that you can grow at least some herbs and maybe a few little vegetables like carrots or whatever, um, celery. And so, I mean, that system still works in small households in, on balconies. So even if you don't have a big veggie patch, I think that is is achievable. And look, it's hard. Organics in, in apartment buildings is hard. So that might be one way apartment owners could tap into um, you know, food waste reduction if you haven't been able to reduce all your food waste, which frankly, you know, no one's going to reduce all the food waste to meal in the home. So what's the last result? The good thing about a worm farm is they eat that food up. It doesn't it doesn't create methane because they're eating it before it turns into a anaerobic context, which can pr- produce the methane, which is a 25 times more uh, powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So you want to keep that food waste out of the landfill bin try and manage it in a way that locally and you know in your own home in a way that is going to be that useful if you produce soil you can grow something else and that's great or even just um go and find some uh poor looking veggie patch near you and, and just, just go and on. sprinkle yeah, the just put it on. yep <laughs> well often apartment buildings have small um common gardens i don't know for instance a uh, place that we used to own an apartment in um couple of the local people who were living in there were actually tending to a garden out the front of the apartment building with uh, worm castings and composting that had come out of some of the homes in that apartment building. So it definitely is something mm. that can happen too. Maybe um, my apartment should get together and produce our own little worm farm for our own little garden. That'd be very cool. Oh, actually, there is. I know definitely down in um, in Docklands, there's, a I think, a... Um, a community garden that was started back 10 years ago on that premise. You know, there is are so many apartments down there um, that this, this garden was started on the basis they wanted to get together and collectively do something that green the space because there weren't many green spaces, but also help with things like waste management. So, you know, there are little things like that popping up in the city of Melbourne. There's a few uh, like that, the near green um, space spaces they're rolling out through the greening uh, initiatives out of Melbourne City Council. So yeah, look, um, definitely getting together as a small community in your local area is is a good way to do this too. Mm, thank you. Uh, was there anything that we've missed um, that you wanted to talk about on the show? Uh, no, I think the, the main thing is uh, if anyone wants to find out more uh, about what we're doing, um, get online and Google Fight Food Waste CRC or if you want to actually go directly to our website, we're at fightfoodwastecrc.com.au. And on that site, you can see what our mission is and what we're trying to achieve, but also yeah, the raft of projects. You know, there's almost up to 100 projects operating at the moment in this space. So, Wow. Yeah, and we'll put those uh, links in our show notes so people can find that. Um without having to look too hard. So we've also got um, some questions from the audience. Yep. Um, so our first one is, um, what are some of the biggest barriers to reducing food waste amongst consumers and how can they be overcome? Well, I think some of the biggest barriers are just, you know, knowledge. And and I mentioned behavioral infrastructure. So behavioral infrastructure is infrastructure for behaviors that are positive or negative, but in this case, positive as in reducing food waste. So that includes things like information, um, domestic appliances like fridges that assist or, you know, the waste management systems like the little cannies under the bench that particular councils will give you for for green waste or whatever. So, yeah, those for me, knowledge and behavioural infrastructure are the biggest barriers 
uh, and they are things that we're trying to actually assist with with the CRC, as are some other groups. I mean, Melbourne City Council, Yarra Council, other you know, a lot of inner city councils are really trying to help with that stuff too. In Melbourne and and certainly around Australia, um, there are other councils doing a lot of great stuff, you know, in that space too. Yeah, I've noticed, um, yeah, quite a few around Melbourne where I am um, doing a lot of good things, which is um, really great because it means I don't have to think about it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, well, (laughs) that's sort of the way that we need to get. So um, the best behavioural infrastructure is is the infrastructure that you don't even notice and you just end up doing stuff. So Mm. the more we can deploy things that make it so easy that you don't even notice it, that's the best possible outcome. As soon as you start noticing it and get to a point where you think, oh, this is too hard or this is hard and even a little bit hard, um, that's not where we want to be. We want to be you know, at a place where it's really, really easy and delivering great benefits based on it. Um, so our second question is, how do cultural attitudes and beliefs about food impact uh, food waste reduction? Uh, they do a lot. Uh, so uh, again, I would recommend anyone who wants to go online and check out our WWW project, which is basically a project in the Engage program of the CLC all around food waste behaviours, practices, et cetera. And there is some um, information in that report regarding this issue. But, I mean, you just think about the way in which, you know, someone of Italian background, Greek background, Vietnamese background, Malaysian background, I mentioned those four, um, you know, countries previously just across those three diverse, sorry, four diverse uh, nations, um, they all do different types of things. And so you, your background, if you are from those those types of places or at least have ancestors or family from that those backgrounds will influence the way that then you practice, um, as do your school environment or your religious environment or your social, um, socioeconomic context. All these things influence uh, your inabi- your inability or your ability to um, to reduce food waste, or for you to actually just waste and not, not reduce food waste. I mean, if we, if we think theoretically about this, academically about this, this is really a range of social structures and your agency to do or not do food waste reduction. Um, it's the uh, it's the work of Anthony Giddens, structuration, which I used in my PhD. Actually, it's where I became a social scientist rather than a um, uh, a, a engineer. But really, this idea of social structures and agency are are really key. And culture, cultural background, religious background, socioeconomic background, all have a role to play. Um, but if we can provide people with enough agency with other things to help them around that, um, so that yeah, you know, all of that background stuff sort of, you know, is there, but is it necessarily the most dominant, you know, um, part of it? I mean, going back to what you said, Gabrielle, where we just end up doing something unconsciously almost, um, that would be the key way to get over that issue. Um, but that's hard because, you know, the way you're brought up and your background are very influential in how you practice and how you behave and who you are as a person. So... Uh, we've got our work cut out, <laughs> but that can also be very positive. So, yeah, you know, Italian and Greek um, communities pretty much eat everything in terms of every you know, vegetable and, and anna, and it came out of a necessity in particular. Um, if you look at what happened, you know, to Italy post Second World War and the fact they went into a deep depression and this was austerity, you had to basically make do with anything you could. Similarly, you know, if you look at Vietnam, they've been through centuries and centuries of attack and war so their people have had to become very self-sufficient and innovative about how they um deal with food systems so similarly with vietnam you look at people and they're amazing at using everything and being and also the the way they use fresh food markets and and use everything just into line um Mm. is quite um you know phenomenal frankly when you go there the amount of uh fresh food and how it's how it's sort of the, th- the throughput of those markets is just insane. So, yeah, look, at, it's a big part of this issue uh, and makes it even more complex than what we've discussed today. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, the one that I've noticed is that um, 
um, I've, I've seen it in like, um, like memes and things where people talk about, you know, that their family grew up using, um, reusing plastic bags, like washing them and drying them or like, um, yeah, takeaway containers, but not just the ones from the restaurants, but like butter ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and like for my family, we just threw those away. We didn't ever reuse those. Yeah. Um, and now it's something that I have to learn. Um, yeah. Some of them, not all of them. And it's harder because you, for you, because you didn't go through that. Mm. So having to learn yeah. something later is always going to be harder. But the more yeah. we can make that easier with assistance, advice, education, and tools, the behavioral infrastructure I talked about, um, mm. the easier it will be for you and others to do uh, what, you know, what we'd hope. So this is a little bit related to this topic as well, um, our last um, audience question. Um, how can food waste reduction initiatives be made more accessible and inclusive for low-income communities and marginalized, marginalized groups? Um, very, very good question. Uh, in terms of the economic food system, so um, the paid food system, we need to have opportunities to cater for everyone. Um and you would hope through things like um, our approaches to behavioural infrastructure and education and advice that, that assists in some way. Uh, almost everyone has access to information online and phones and all that kind of stuff. So if we are working with technology, that usually can be something we can use to diffuse um, those tools to assist people. And if it's framed, it might be framed in a different way. Like it, might, it might actually be more about, hey, it's going to save you money. <laughs> Or, yeah. or um, that we are actually thinking about how we disseminate information in different languages or to different groups from different perspectives based on their world. You know, it again, comes back to empathy and understanding their position, um, their world, and how things best resonate. Now, that takes a lot of work because you've got to then do a whole lot of it, you know, diverse research about how you cater for those different groups. But you, we would hope... Um, that if we go to a behaviour change campaign model, that we have enough resources to do the work that is going to be able to resonate with everyone in the in the community. Now, if people get to a point where they can't afford food, which we are seeing more of, there is no doubt about it. Everyone's talking about it in the food charity space. Brianna from Food Bank, um, Ronnie from Oz Harvest, certainly made it clear that the demand for their services has skyrocketed as these inflationary and interest rate and other you know, pressure type mechanisms are applied. Um, we have very good food charities in Australia. Um, they are very good at getting food to people who can't afford it, but we need to make it even easier. So I would hope the federal government makes it absolutely tax incentivized as a system so that we can get more of this food to people and make it cheaper to donate food than to send it to landfill, you know, from industry's perspective. So that as people fall into food stress, they do have access to good nutritious food easily through these groups. You know, we, we have to increase funding to food bank. We can't cut the funding to food bank. We need to incentivize industry to donate food when they don't have somewhere for it to go to sell it. Um, I think all, as we've said all the way along um, with this, Gabrielle, it is a complex uh, systems-based um, issue that you have to deal with all of these different tensions, paradoxes, um, opportunities, threats, et cetera, and uh, we're trying to play in all, all of those you know, areas with this with this um, cooperative research. And Thank you. Um, definitely. I think... This is just one step or one drop into the bucket of what we need to do. Yep. Um, so thank you for um, well, thank you for um, talking to me today. It was very interesting, and um, I'm feeling feeling a little bit more optimistic about what's going to be happening in the future. Um, hopefully, 2030 will half our food waste. Um, so um, if people want to find out more about you know you and your work, and um, hopefully we'll get some new information out uh soon where can they find it certainly you know any of my projects um you can you can go onto rmit's website and just google me and my my profile will come up and you can actually look at all the projects i'm working on um that are 
food waste based as well as other things. So we've just done a big um, strategy for the federal government about uh, circular economy for design and all of the links for that are up there too. So just Google me and I should come up as uh, an RMIT link. But as I said also before, um, for the Fight Food Waste CRC, if you just go to fightfoodwastecrc.com.au or Google the Fight Food Waste CRC, you will get to our page and see everything about us and all of our projects. Uh, and look, happy for anyone if they want to reach out. Um, my contact details are on all of those forums. So if you want to shoot me an email and ask me anything, uh, feel free. And uh, I'm always happy to sort of talk to people about things that align with this work. Um, certainly have had people reach out after these kind of things before and some of them now work for me. So <laughs> no, it's it's certainly a, a really rewarding area. So if this is of interest, do reach out. There are lots of opportunities to participate in really cool research and um, and very practical research. Yeah. We don't really call ourselves academics. We call ourselves pracademics because we're very practical in our academic pursuits at RMIT. I love that. That's that's a great term. Um, yeah, and um, again, uh, we'll put all those links in our show notes so people can find them. But yeah, thank you so much for coming on. No um, yeah, thank you. Well, good. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to On the House, produced by the Household Management Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, hm.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra. Thanks for tuning in.